Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to lecture number nine at the Art Students League. Uh, we are working on uh, anatomy for artists. So this is mostly from the point of view of an artist, different from medical anatomy. Tonight, uh, I would like to focus on the forms of the arm. It's a, a bit of a complex area, but uh, with, with some study, uh, you, you'll be able to understand it quite well. Um, we're going to look at uh, both the upper arm and the forearm. And mostly, uh, what we need to talk about first is the uh, skeletal structure. Uh, we're going to see how these bones operate, how they move, and uh, what artists know about drawing this particular area of the figure. So the first thing to do is to uh, uh, get some of the skeletal structure up there. I'm going to start with the uh, rib cage. We really only need half of the rib cage. And then uh, the shoulder blade, the scapula. In these front views, the shoulder blade sticks out a little bit beyond the uh, rib cage. You run into that little socket. You put the, uh, the ball or the, or the head of the humerus into the uh, socket. You have a little tuberosity out here. And then the shaft or the cylinder, basically a cylinder for the shaft of the uh, humerus. It's as, about as long as the rib cage. So the rib cage is 12 inches. So this is about 12 inches for your, for your humerus or your upper arm. It just seems to clear the bottom of the rib cage. You run into these little condyles, the inner condyle here on the inside, and to a lesser degree, the outer condyle over there at the bottom of the humerus. You can feel that inner condyle. That's a great landmark on the, on the figure. And you can feel it. It's just clearing uh, the bottom of your uh, rib cage. Uh, between, these, between these two condyles, the inner condyle and the outer condyle, we have some shape down here that to the bottom of the humerus that we need to look into. The first shape we uh, run into uh, is a spool, a spool-like shape. It's a horizontal spool-looking shape of bone called the uh, trochlea. It's on a little uh, angle. It's tilted right in there. These are the shapes uh, uh, at the ends of the bones. And then next to that little spool, you have a little rounded process before you get to the outer condyle. The rounded process is called the capitellum, and uh, the spool is going to be for uh, the forearm bone on the inside, and the little ball-like shape is going to be for the, the bone on the outside. Now, when we look at these skeletons, we always use the anatomical uh, point of view. That means arms at the side of the body and palms forward. And in that position, you would have, and by the way, I'm doing uh, a front view, and we're doing the left arm, so we're doing this one here. Things get a little complex when it comes to uh, arms and forearms, so we have to label our views so that we know what we're talking about here. We're talking about the left arm in the front view. And uh, the bone on the inside, uh, with the palm forward is going to be your ulnar bone and the bone on the outside is called the radius. You can imagine right now there's some great similarities here between the uh, forearms and the lower legs as there is comparative relationships between hands and feet. So the next thing to know is that in uh, most uh, positions, I mean, when the arms are at the side of the body, the upper arm tends to, the humerus tends to lean inward a little bit. So if, if you see poses like that, that's quite natural for the upper arm to be drawn going inward a little bit. And as you can see on me with the palms forward, the forearms go outward. That's something that artists are very aware of that this is coming either straight down or a little bit inward, and then your forearms go leaning out at an angle. They're not straight. I can't do it straight with the palm forward. It won't work that way. 
And the whole reason why the, arm, the forearm goes out like that is because of this little spool shape that I mentioned. It's tilted. And so when the ulnar grabs the spool, it makes the whole uh, ulnar bone go off at the angle the way the spool is tilted. You'll be able to come up uh, after the lecture and take a closer look. Uh, I, I would love for you to come and take a closer look at this on the skeleton. So now uh, we know that the, uh, the limbs of the human, the bones uh, of the upper limb and the uh, lower limbs, they uh, decrease in length by approximately one-fifth. By that I mean if, if you take the length of the upper arm or the humerus and you take a little bit off or take about a fifth off, what you're left with is the length for the bones of the forearm. And it's true even for the hand. If you took about a fifth off of the radius and the ulnar, you would have the length of the hand with the fingers extended out. So let's just take a little bit off of this humerus and then mark off what's left or four fifths down here. And let's put a little line guiding us, you know, with the fact that the bones go outward like that. Also, when somebody, when your model, you know, puts their, their arms across their chest, we, because of this angle here, we'd expect the arm to come over and go this way, right? We'd expect it to go like that and like that. Uh, I'm going to talk later about uh, what happens when these forearm bones move on one another, which is quite an interesting story that we need to get into. You know there is movement or rotation uh, to the bones of the forearm. So, but right now we're going to do the ulnar bone uh, on the inside. Just remember ulnar inside little finger. That's a little rhyme that we talk about in art circles. The ulnar, the inside, and the little finger. The radius on the outside and the thumb. It's just the thing you remember for uh, forever. Uh, what it is, is at the top of the ulnar bone, uh, it has a kind, of a kind of a cavity, we call it the sigmoid cavity, and it bites, literally just kind of in, like a mouth. That cavity at the top of your ulnar bone is uh, shaped like an open mouth, and it bites or grabs the spool over here on the lower end of the humerus. So I'm just going to draw it in this front view. You can't really see it, but it's biting the spool. And then this bone, the ulnar on the inside, has a little wiggle to it, has a little curvature to it. It curves away from the body and then it slightly curves in towards the body. Bones are beautiful. They have beautiful curves to them. It's never like a stick. You don't want to draw your limbs too stiff like a stick. It has a nice curvature to it. Uh, the ulnar bone on the inside goes from thicker at the top to thinner at the bottom, thick to thin and then it has a big rounded knob at the bottom of it called the head of the ulnar, right? You all know that, that's a big uh, landmark. Uh, you can see it uh, on, your, on your models, this big knob right here is the head. It's kind of strange, the head is at the bottom, but it's called the head of the ulnar. Great landmark, and it kind of tells you uh, that the wrist is going to begin right after that knob. So when you're looking at a model and you see this famous projection, you know the wrist is coming right after that. Don't make the, the bump too large though. Sometimes students see a little bump like that and make it too big. So that's your ulnar on the inside. On the outside, we have the radius bone. And what's so fascinating to me about the radius um, is that at the top of it, and those of you in the front rows can see this, it has, believe it or not, the bone is shaped like a wheel. It's a horizontal wheel. It's, very, it's a round, it's exactly like a wheel at the top of the bone, and then this cylinder-like shaft comes down, and just the opposite of the ulnar, the, um, the radius goes from being narrower to thicker uh, towards the bottom. And that's how they support one another. You know, one, one goes from uh, thick to thin, and the other one goes from thin to thick, like that. 
So it's a pretty supportive uh, structure. So here's the wheel horizontally, and it just uh, connects or articulates with this rounded process right here at the lower end of the humerus. The wheel just goes right up against the ball-like process, the capitellum. And then the cylinder or the shaft comes down, down, not much of an S, just more of one big curve coming down. It ends a little bit lower than the bottom of the ulnar bone, and the radius has a little cavity at the bottom. And that little cavity is to carry the wrist, to carry the wrist bones. The upper row of wrist bones go right into that little socket or cavity. So uh, thinking about that wheel, and we'll, well, we'll start with the ulnar first. The ulnar basically has a big mouth-like shape that bites the horizontal spool at the lower end of the humerus. And therefore, what the ulnar contributes to the movement at the elbow is to allow your arm to go up and down. In fact, that's all the ulnar can do in life, is just go up and down. Kind of like an elevator operator, although they don't have too many elevator operators anymore. It was a, actually, it was a challenging job to have because <clears throat> it affects your balance and your, your ear, ears if you go up and down all day long. But anyways, that's the ulnar for you. It just goes up and down in life. But the radius is something quite different. With that horizontal wheel there, the radius is able to spin around. As you can see, I'm demonstrating it here. The radius, the wheel of the radius is spinning on the lower end of the humerus. And as you can see, the radius goes from being on the outside, side by side with the ulnar, spinning around, and now it crosses over the ulnar bone. Of course, at the same time that the radius is spinning, it can also go up and down as well. There's quite an amazing structure at the elbow. I know because I really broke my elbow when I was 12 years old, falling on the pavement. I broke all these bones in here. But uh, it's a marvelous structure because when the radius spins around, now here's the thing that artists know, you say to yourself, the, the radius carries the hand, not the ulnar. The ulnar is just hanging on over there. You have a little bitty ligament which makes it uh, connect to the hand, but mostly, you can see on the skeleton, the hand and the wrist is connected to the radius bone. So when your radius spins around, it takes the hand with it. And you can take your hand from the palm up position to maybe halfway and then palm down. Yeah? So we have palm up and palm down. But also, keep in mind that your model may take a pose where they do more than that. Like if the thumb is over here on the outside, we are capable of almost bringing the thumb all the way around to where it began. That's almost 360 degrees. How did I do that if the radius only goes from here to here? Well, I use this up here, or your model is using this joint as well, so that you can get almost 360 degrees. Well, it's very easy to remember the position of the arm with the palm up or the palm down. Palm up is called supination. And I always remember it because it's the way, it's like a bowl of soup, the way a bowl of soup would be. So that's supination, palm down is pronation, okay? So what an amazing structure you have here, the little wheel at the top of the radius, spinning and crossing the bones, but also taking the hand with it. So as a beginner, I always thought somehow my hand was turning here at the wrist. It's not turning at the wrist. It's, it occurs up here where that little wheel is spinning around. 
So an artist cannot really just change the hand in that painting or that drawing without changing the whole forearm. See, because the bones now are side by side with the palm up. And the muscles are side by side. But when I cross the bones, I've crossed the muscles as well. So the forearm is much more rounded. It should be drawn and painted much more rounded. And the muscles are in a crossing direction. They're going from outside to inside, the way the radius bone is going this way, from outside to inside. So you draw your forearm flatter when the palm is up, and you have to draw your forearm more as a cylinder, more rounded when the palms are down. All right, so tonight uh, we're going to do the hand next week, so tonight we'll just stick a little shape in there. Uh, Raphael tells us that a quarter of an apple is fine, and then we run into the, the body of the hand, and then we have our phalanges over here, and the thumb would have to be over on this side if I'm doing the front view of the uh, left arm. Might as well get it up there at the same time, go right over here and look at the back view of, of half of your rib cage. Here's the uh, all important rib cage shape without the individual ribs. We want the mass of it. We want to uh, think about it because it's easily the largest form of the body. We've got a little scapula here, which is not just a, a flat triangular shaped bone. Um, we really have to understand that it's got a curve to it as well. You see it's taking up its position on the rib cage, so it has to curve. The shoulder blade has a bit of a curve to it to live on the curving rib cage. So it is a triangle, it is a flat bone, but it has kind of a curve, just like your sacrum down there near your pelvis is a triangle that has a curve to it. All right, so we have a little flat triangular scapula here, and it has a bony ridge called the spine going across it right about there, with a large process out there on the outside called your acromion process. Usually you run into a bump right here uh, on, the, uh, on the life model. Uh, the acromion process would be this one over here at the end of the spine of the scapula. That's the acromion process, and it connects with the outer end of the collarbone. Now, the outer end of the collarbone is what sticks up. This skeleton is put together very well. You see, it's not the acromion that sticks up. It's the outer end of the collarbone that sticks up. But it's where it meets the acromion. So we're half right. You could say it's acromion, but it's really the outer end of the collarbone that makes a little bump in the contour when you're doing your contour line uh, around the outside of the uh, shoulder. And so this is our back view. We have a little cavity over here. Once again, uh, the head of the humerus, this is a shallow cavity, a shallow ball and socket joint. So it's much more easy to dislocate your shoulder than it is to dislocate the ball and socket of your hip. And people do dislocate their shoulders all the time. And the collarbone, the clavicle, is the most broken bone of the body. So it's, a, it's an interesting structure, this upper limb. It's mostly designed for uh, moving, moving the upper limbs around in all different positions in space. So it has to be very free and mobile, and so it sacrifices some strength because of that. Down here, you have to be really strong uh, because you're, you're walking upright. So a little different function there between the uh, lower limbs and the upper limbs. It's about one-third of a ball, and then a little square-like process, tuberosity there. This is our back view. And we are doing, uh, once again, we're doing the back view. Uh, oh, this time we're doing the back view of the right arm. This is the front left, and now I'm doing the back right arm. So we can see some of the forms that live on the bones uh, in the back view. A uh, little cylinder is all you need to draw right here. And uh, 
where once again we run into these condyles. The inner condyle is more, pro more pronounced than the outer condyle. The inner condyle, you can feel it. You can almost always see it on your models. The outer condyle, a little harder to see, but very easy to know where it is because it's right across the street from the inner condyle. So you can just shoot a line across and know where it is. And then we run into uh, uh, proportion. We're going to get that angle again going this way. Unless the palm is down, right? Did I tell you that yet? Maybe I didn't tell you. The forearm angles out, right, with the palms forward. But when you put your palm down, as in supination, no more angling out, you see? The upper arm is now in line with the lower arm. Palm up, the bones go outward. Palm down, they are in line. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, variation of thrusts. This is a great pose for the arm, to have the upper arm going down and in, to have the forearm doing the opposite, right? Contraposto, going out, and then maybe turning the hand back in. This is a famous statue, right, that does this, yeah, like that. In, out, in. So anyways, we're going to cut off, uh, we want four-fifths of, of the upper arm to come down here for the radius and the ulnar. Uh, we run into a big process on the back of the uh, ulnar bone on the inside. Here it is. And there, right here, I know we're doing the right arm, but I can show you on either arm. Look at that process in the back there at the upper end of the ulnar. That's the point of your elbow. Uh, we call that the olecranon process. Not a very big bump at all, um, you see, when the elbow is extended. Uh, the point of the elbow, or, or this process right here, this square-like process, is going to get more pronounced on the figures that you draw when the elbow is bent. See, because right now with the elbow uh, extended or straight, uh, a lot of the upper end of the ulnar goes into a big hole back here uh, on the humerus. So a lot of that is, is in that little hole now. But when I bend the elbow, you notice how the, the process now comes out, sticks out. So it's more prominent on a bent elbow. Never humongous. Don't, don't make the point of the elbow too big. But now more prominent than when it's straight. You, you hardly have a bump at all. Uh, when the elbow is extended or straight. Also, I want you to notice something else. The inner condyle of the humerus, the uh, point of the elbow or the olecranon process of the humerus, and the outer condyle here, when the elbow is straight or open or extended, those three pieces of bone are all on the same horizontal line. But when you bend, when your model bends his or her elbow, notice how the point of the elbow just dropped down about an inch. So artists will put a little mark here at the inner condyle. They'll put a little mark here at the uh, uh, olecranon or the point of the elbow, an inch down. And then they'll usually put a little mark for the outer condyle back an inch up. I have, seen this, I have seen this on Michelangelo's drawings. He puts a little circle on those three points. He makes like a little triangle of points with the elbow uh, bent. So good things to know. And um, we get, once again, we get a very subtle little S curve to the shaft of the ulnar on the inside. It curves away from the rib cage or the body, and then it curves in towards the body at the lower half. And so there it is going from its uh, olecranon or point of the elbow and going from thick to thin and then having a little rounded uh, knob at the bottom called the head of the ulnar. Over here on the outside, we run into that little ball-like process uh, before we get to the outer condyle. These are condyles, right? And then uh, the wheel of the radius just uh, uh, moves right up 
and to articulate with that ball-like process the capitellum. So here's the wheel, and then this cylindrical type shaft getting thicker as it comes down, one big sweeping curve, a little lower than the uh, knob or the head of the ulnar, and a little cavity at the bottom, always to carry the hand or to carry the wrist, and then the hand. Always say to yourself, the radius owns or carries the hand. The, the ulnar, you see there's even a big gap here between the, the wrist and the ulnar. See, the wrist uh, is not connected to the ulnar the way the radius really connects to the, to the wrist bones. Of course, we don't have a hole here on the living. We have a little piece of rope. We have a little piece of ligament here that prevents the, uh, the ulnar from, you know, moving away from the, the wrist. But it's a big gap, so we really say it really is your radius that owns or uh, carries your, your hand. All right, so we have the wrist there. Quarter of an apple, uh, Raphael tells us. The body of the hand, which is going to be called um, metacarpal bones in there. And then the, uh, the phalanges for uh, the fingers. The thumb is still going to be over here on the right side, if you think about it. Uh, because we're doing the right arm from the back, so the thumb is over here on this side. I had done this lecture many years ago, and then I took uh, my students up to the Metropolitan Museum for a drawing show, and uh, one of my students pointed out to me, it was actually a master drawing show, one of my students pointed out to me that the master had drawn the thumb on the wrong side of the hand on one of the figures in the drawing. So it happens, but it probably wasn't a great master show. It, was, it wasn't the greatest, but it can, it can happen to you because with all this rotating, all this uh, turning that can go on with the uh, forearm, uh, it's one of your most challenging areas to, to study. And you'll, you will have to give it some more study uh, than what we uh, go over tonight. But all these lectures are designed to do is to get you involved in it and the hope is that you'll, you'll take it up more intensely with your books and skeletons and models and maybe you know, more talks and more lectures. But thank goodness we don't have all that rotation down there on the leg. And then once, once those muscles start crossing over, you know, we, we've got to watch ourselves a little bit. But we'll get it. I'll, I'll explain it so that uh, it'll allow you to continue to study and, and not be so worried about it. Well, you do have on your, um, uh, on your uh, shoulder blade, your scapula, there's a, a little process, looks like a little bent finger on the front of it right there, kind of unusual. Uh, the coracoid process, it's called. There it is, right there. It's like a little bent finger. Coracoid just means the crow's beak. And uh, it's deep, you don't really see it, but we have some uh, muscles of the arm that it, will be attaching to that little process. So I pointed out to you uh, the little crow's beak right there on the front of the scapula. Supposedly, in, uh, I think it's in Gray's Anatomy, they tell, you, tell us that we can push uh, be right behind our collarbone, between our collarbone, uh, where our deltoid meets our uh, pectoral muscle. You know, this little groove right in here between your shoulder or deltoid and your pectoral just under the collarbone. Uh, they tell us we're supposed to be able to feel uh, the little uh, crow's beak bone in that little groove, but I can't feel mine and I ain't pressing any deeper. <laughs> and I suggest you don't press too hard uh, either. So if you feel it, great. If you don't, at least you know about uh, where it is. Uh, another view here, we might as well take it up. Very simple, good practice. Front view again. We're gonna do the front. We're gonna do the half of the rib cage. We got a little shoulder blade coming out. We've got proportional boxes here. Don't forget the great value of using these six inch cubes. They are the proportions related to the skeleton. 
So, of course, we know that the shoulder blade, the scapular is six inches. We use another proportional box. We know the rib cage has a length of 12 inches. Keep in mind, this is just a half of the rib cage. We would have the same thing over here on the other side. All right, so we're gonna draw the uh, little ball, or it's really one third of a ball shape, and then a little square tuberosity, and then just drawing a cylinder coming down for the humerus. And then we run into the more prominent inner condyle right here. See, it's a little bit lower than the rib cage uh, on purpose, because otherwise that condyle, that bump on your elbow on the inside would be scratching your ribs all the time. So it just seems to clear the rib cage a little bit. Then we have the outer uh, condyle, not so prominent. We have that mouth, which you'll have to look on the skeleton to see the bit. You'll have to take my word for it now and then look on the skeleton later. The upper end of the bone on the inside, the ulnar, has this mouth that grabs the spool right in here, the spool shape between the condyles on the humerus. So there it is, just like in this front view, I'm still doing front left, the ulnar. This, this would be like the, um, uh, like the lower lip, you might say, and the upper lip is a rat biting the spool uh, in the back, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, the ulnar, you know, comes down at this little angle, but I'm not going to draw it coming all the way down now. I'm going to draw it very lightly. I'm going to start now with the wheel of the radius on the outside. And this time I'm going to draw the radius bone rotated and crossed over. Uh, what it does is it spins around the ulnar and lands over here on the inside. Let's make sure we have our proportion a little bit less than the upper arm, a little bit less so we have to stop it right there. We run into a little cavity. Down here would be that great landmark on the ulnar, the little knob just above the wrist. And this time, here's your uh, wrist bones. We call that carpus, right? Carpus in the ancient Greek means wrist. Uh, so these little bones in here we'll do uh, next week. Your wrist bones, quite cool. And then you have these next set of bones, these long bones are beyond the wrist, so those are called your meta, metacarpals. Meta meaning beyond. And then the three bones in every finger are just called phalanges. Phalange means a row of soldiers from the ancient Latin or Greek, a row of soldiers. Only two soldiers in the thumb, three soldiers in all the other fingers. So wrist, carpus, and then the body of the hand has those long bones called metacarpals in here, and then three phalanges in your fingers, except the thumb and the great toe only have two. So look what happened over here now, look at that. That's certainly possible. Instead of the two bones and the forearm being side by side, they, the radius has now crossed over the ulnar. And so that would have to mean that we are no longer looking at the palm of the hand, but we are looking now at the back of this uh, hand. We're doing this right here. We're doing a left arm. We have, I have just crossed my radius over my ulnar, and now you're looking at the back of the hand, right? So, very good. Uh, we have all that here. If you want to uh, make it clear when you look over your drawings, you could put a P on that to remember that you're, you're showing the palm view. And over here, uh, we are doing the back view of the whole arm, right? Back or posterior view of that arm. This is front left with the palm forward. This is front left with the palm turned down. The bones are crossed. Complex, right? Already in the bones, but you're learning so much. It's, it's, bones are key when it comes to this uh, forearm. In fact, the bone on the inside, this, this ulnar bone right here, this is all uh, what we call subcutaneous. 
meaning right under the skin. So uh, if we didn't know how to draw that bone, we're out of luck in doing a good forearm. You can tap, tap, tap. You can tap from your, the point of your elbow. And you could tap all the way down the shaft of your ulna and come right to this knob at the bottom. So it's there. It's right under the skin. You want to get to know it. And the way to know it is to just draw it on the skeleton a few times. Just like you draw skulls and you draw pelvises and you draw rib cages. Truly, you don't even need a whole skeleton. All you need is a, a half skeleton because it's similar on either side. Well, I want to get into uh, some forms now. Off of this little crow's beak right here, you have a muscle that you're not going to see very often. Okay, I'm, I'm talking to the artist now. Something you're not going to see very often. But once in a while you might, so it's interesting to have a look at it. It grows off of your little uh, crow's beak or the acromium, uh, the coracoid process. It comes down, a little uh, narrow muscle, and it attaches halfway down on the inside of the shaft of the humerus, uh, halfway down. So that's very easy for me to draw it from here. There's just a little string coming down like this. Well, that is called the crucifixion muscle, the coracobrachialis muscle. Brachialis just means an arm, and this is the coracoid process. So you see how the names can give you some ideas. The names are not really important. There are a lot of names on this forearm, all kinds of muscle names. Not important tonight to remember all those names. But very nice to think about the fact that we have a nickname for coracobrachialis, the crucifixion muscle. And they call it that because you would only see it on pretty well-defined people when the arm is up, as in a crucifixion. And it will be coming out of the armpit area, coming out from uh, uh, underneath the rib cage in the armpit area, and it'll be going up into the arm a little string of muscle and it will insert between your biceps and your triceps. We're going to draw that now. If you want to see if an artist really knows their anatomy, just ask them to do a drawing of the raised arm. This is a real challenge. If you can't do it the first time, don't worry. I practice these things over and over. But this will give you a little look at uh, what this muscle would look like and how we might see it on the surface if we do a raised arm. In this view, you won't see it because we're going to be putting the biceps right over it. Okay, so let's go over here and think about, think about a big oval for the rib cage right now. And think about maybe the upper half of the rib cage right in here. You, you run into your pectoral muscles. They wrap around the upper half of the rib cage, the great pectorals. Uh, we're looking at this one over here now. I guess we're going to do a left arm. Uh, and then the pectoral, when you raise your arm, the pectoral changes shape because the fibers leave the body and they go up this way to the, uh, to the bone, to the uh, humerus uh, that has been raised up in that socket. So there is a little change from maybe a square-shaped pectoral now your pectoral looks much more like a triangle when you raise your arm. So there it is going up, wrapping around the, uh, the bone a little bit here. And then what we run into right underneath our great pectoral uh, is first thing would be your, your biceps right in here. And here's, the, here's where you would see the little crucifixion muscle. It would be coming out from underneath the pectoral and it would be inserting right there between biceps and triceps. Here's the triceps over here. Also inserting, I'll get out of your way in a moment, also inserting, you see all this insertion right here? Everybody going between biceps and triceps. That little sliver right there, there's the little uh, crucifixion muscle 
coming out from underneath the great pectoral, diving in between biceps and triceps to get here, to get halfway down the shaft, but in this case, up the shaft, right? Because now we're going up. And also inserting between your biceps and triceps is some nice muscle from the back of the rib cage. The first one in here is very thick. That's your lats. Do you know latissimus dorsi? All of this right here is a huge a piece of muscle on your back. It's very thick. It goes up into your arm. That's your piece of your lats. And right on top of the lats, not as well known, but also inserting there, is a little muscle that lives right here on the lower portion of the shoulder blade. It's shaped like a little puffy egg. Teres major, it's called. The teres major is a little egg shape, always right next to the armpit. If you look at some of your models, look at the armpit, and just, just to this side, just, just over here on the rib cage, just to the left of the armpit, you should see a little egg coming out of the back. That's teres major. These are muscles on the shoulder blade, right? Teres major. Teres major is one of the rotator cuff muscles. They go from shoulder blade to your arm, to your humerus. So, we've got it, we did it, look at that. These are the forms of the raised arm. You have a big chunk of muscle in the front of the armpit here, which is your great pectoral. And over here, you have a big, thick portion of the lats coming off of the back of the rib cage. So look at this, here's the, here's the big mass of the pectoral, and here's the big mass over here of the lats. It's the whole reason why we have an armpit, is because you have a thick muscle in the front, and you have a thick muscle in the back. So you're gonna get a big hole or a depression between those two. Uh, sliding down, from under, also from underneath the pectoral, decorating the sides of the rib cage right in here. We usually can catch on a well-developed model, we can catch maybe one, two, three little digits from the serratus anterior muscles. Michelangelo loves to decorate the sides of the rib cage right here with three little finger muscles. They're decorations is what they are. You're trying to figure out what to decorate your figures with. You've got an outside contour, and then you're trying to figure out what to do inside your drawing, what to show up and what to not show up. They love to put three little cylinders right there, three little fingers. They're not ribs, but they live on the ribs. We have more than that, there are about eight of them, but the rest of them are underneath the pectoral. You usually see a little three below the uh, pectoral. Uh, I'm going to refer now to uh, Richard, ha Richard uh, Hatton's book called Figure Drawing because uh, it's a wonderful book, a lot of information, and he has a little uh, rhyme which helps you to remember the forms that you need to draw when you do a raised arm. Okay, so what he says is remember this little rhyme which is try to let Corby Peck. Try to let Corby. A Corby in Scotland is a crow. So try to let the Corby Peck. All right, and you got all your forms. Here's the great pectoral. I'm going backwards now. Here's the B for your biceps. Here's the uh, uh, C for crucifixion muscle. Can you see it right there? The little piece of uh, fiber that comes out from underneath the pectoral and dives in between the biceps and triceps. It's nothing like thick biceps or triceps. It's just a little sliver. Although, if you're studying anatomy, I remember, oh, maybe 100 years ago, I went to the Port Authority bookstore and got a muscle magazine of Arnold Schwarzenegger and his crucifixion muscle was bigger than my biceps. 
But it was a great thing to do, you know, look at these muscle pig pictures to try to figure out, you know, where's all the anatomy and, and, and what does it look like when it's really clear and developed. So it worked out well, but no one would have it that big. That was a special case. So the C is for the crucifixion or coracobrachialis. The L is right here. There's your big lats or latissimus dorsi. And uh, T is for triceps. And the last T is for the little muscle that always follows the lats and lives right here as the little egg on the shoulder blade, teres major. A teres is a rope. So it's the, the, the ancient Latin, they called that little muscle the large rope. You can come up also uh, after the lecture and you can look at this little large rope right here next to the armpit. The little egg-like shape next to the armpit. It's very clear on models. That's not something that you, uh, you, you would be unable to see. You usually can see the teres major just to the left of the armpit. Okay, so if you're unsuccessful in doing this view right away, have no fear. I did a lot of monsters before I could handle such a raised arm drawing. But instead of fudging it, you know, and not really knowing what I'm doing, it's nice to go over these things, right? See if we really uh, can build a figure. If you can build your own figure, then when you go to the model, you will know better what you are observing, what you are looking at. Makes all the difference in the world. Let's get some muscles up here before the clock uh, catches us. So, on the front of the humerus, on the lower half, we have kind of a little flat muscle that lives right on the bone, and it inserts itself right into the top here of the forearm bone on the inside. Maybe you can remember, the bone on the inside is the ulnar. The bone on the outside is the radius. So this little flat muscle uh, on half of your upper arm, the lower half, the muscle is just called brachialis, which means arm. And it's under your biceps. But I do have to point it out anyways, because when you look at a side view, and I may not have time to do the side view tonight, but when you look in one of your anatomy books at the side view, it's right here in the middle. See, the biceps is in the front, the triceps is on the back, and so that brachialis muscle would be here in the middle of my upper arm. Think of it like the baloney between two pieces of bread. The biceps is one piece of bread, triceps is the other piece of bread, and this is the baloney in the middle, the brachialis muscle. So I'm poking myself right now, and I'm not poking my biceps, I'm poking the brachialis muscle. But on the living, you're probably not going to see separation between brachialis and biceps. They kind of live together. But there it is, and I thought you'd like to know what is over here on the side of your arm between your biceps and triceps. We just wouldn't be accurate if we said all you had was biceps and triceps. So you have a little piece of meat in between those two famous groups. And also, you need to know that the brachialis under your biceps is connected to your ulnar. So when this brachialis muscle pulls, it pulls the ulnar up like this. That's not biceps, because that's the brachialis muscle going into the ulnar. So it's really pulling on the ulnar. Biceps will help. Let's, <clears throat> let's do biceps. It's the two-headed muscle, right? Biceps. One head is from this little uh, crow's beak right here on your shoulder blade. There it is, like a little finger bent. Uh, one of the uh, heads of the biceps, along with the crucifixion muscle, comes from that place on your shoulder blade. A little tendon comes down and then swells up into a belly, right? You know muscles have a tendon, and then they have this bulging belly, and then usually they have a tendon at the bottom where they attach to a different bone. 
tendon, belly, tendon. It's what most muscles do. Uh, so there's the inner head of the biceps. And I'm gonna just go ahead at the same time and put the outer head on as well. Uh, this, is all, this is not something you have to remember from tonight's lecture. You can watch me going through it and that gives you an idea of how to study it a little bit and just look in one of your anatomy books at where the biceps starts and where does the biceps end. If you can't tell yourself where it ends, then you have to look it up because you need to know for drawing and painting and sculpting, where does the form start, where does the form end? So you can be masterful with your work. So the outer head is going to start at the top right here of the ball and socket on the shoulder blade, at the very top of the socket. It has a very long tendon that comes down like this right down the front of the uh, humerus, and then the belly starts here, uh, just below the bowl and socket. We run into the, be the second belly. So here's the inner belly and the outer belly. You will not see a, a black line between the two on your models. This shape right in here is two bellies, living as one. Well, if you, uh, if you schlep around uh, Manhattan with too many groceries, you might feel a pain under your deltoid. That would be this uh, tendon of the long belly of the, of the biceps speaking to you, saying that it's getting a little agitated, you need to put some of those groceries down or get, get a wheelie cart or something. Usually the pain under the deltoid is this uh, tendon of the biceps screaming a little bit. So then we run into a common tendon which dives down the front of the elbow and goes right here into the uh, upper end of the radius bone on the outside. So, you're, so the, the muscle under the biceps went into the ulnar and the biceps themselves go into the radius. That makes perfect sense. You've got muscles to lift up both forearm bones, right? It's flexion. They are flexing or bending the elbow for you. The triceps on the back would open up the elbow, and so we call that extension. So the triceps is an extensor, and the biceps is a flexor. To flex is to close down. To extend is to open it up. Got it? So there's our biceps inserting, and in fact, you can come up to some of these uh, great skeletons and you can see a big tuberosity right here below the wheel of the radius, and that is called the biceps bump, or the biceps tuberosity, which tells us that's where the biceps has to go. And actually on this man, uh, that bump on his radius is very big. So I might predict that he did something in life with his upper arms and especially maybe with his biceps. These, these bumps on the bone tend to get more pronounced if we lead a life where we're using that muscle so much. Yes, calcium can grow. A pitcher, one who pitches a ball uh, right-handed, will have a bigger collarbone on the right at the end of life than the collarbone on the left. So it's kind of cool, you know, how uh, these scientists can tell what they ate and what they did just by looking at the bones and sometimes fragments. So uh, along with the biceps, we, uh, we take a look at the back of the arm over here. It's so much like the lower leg. We run into three shapes for the triceps. Two on the front for the biceps and three shapes on the upper arm in the back view for the triceps. Most beginners are very unclear about drawing the back view of the upper arm. So this is good that we uh, take it up. Well, uh, the three bellies all go into a common tendon which lives on the lower half 
of the humerus, on the back of the humerus, and that common tendon goes down and attaches to the top of that great landmark, the point of your elbow, called the olecranon process. This great thing here, which is, of course, the point of your elbow is the upper end in the back of the ulnar bone, right? The point of the elbow is with the ulnar. So isn't that, doesn't that remind you of Achilles tendon or uh, maybe the, the quadriceps, you know, going into the patella? There's a lot of relationship between you know, animals that are on all fours, so their upper limbs and their lower limbs are very similar. And ours are too, except they've changed a bit now because we decided to go upright. Boy, is my back telling me I'm upright. So here's the three uh, forms. They fit into, it's, it's a little bit of a morbid idea, but they, they fit into a, a shape that goes from narrow to wide to narrow. Kind of looks like an ancient casket or something. So I, I always draw those, the, those little enveloping lines here on the back of the upper arm. I go drawing that little shape like that to, to hold in these uh, shapes for the triceps. So it's, it's a handy little thing. I believe it's in Hatton's book, Figure Drawing. The, the triceps go from narrow to wide and then they come down narrow again. Now we can put them in. Here we are on the, uh, the inner border of the humerus. This is the, uh, the, the head on the inside of the uh, triceps, the medial head. Oh yes, this, this is very much like your quadriceps. And this is the common tendon, and this would be related to your patella or your kneecap. So here we have the, uh, the inner belly. And over here, coming off of the outside of the shaft of the bone, just, just below the ball and socket, and then coming in and attaching to the outside of that common tendon, whereas the belly on the inside came in and attached to the in, inner border of that common tendon. We have the inner head of the triceps, and we have the outer head of the triceps. Notice how the inner head is lower, just like on your, the front of your thigh. And now we have the middle head. And the middle head starts up here, off of the, the bottom of the socket. I put a little red dot right there at the bottom of the socket of the shoulder blade. And then we get the muscle starts swelling up as it comes down. It really lives on top of most of the inner head of the triceps and it goes right into the top of the common tendon like that. So there is a feeling on the, the back of the arm, on the inside, it'll, it'll look like there's a larger mass than over there on the outside. And it is because there's, there's two, there's two bellies, one almost on top of the other one. On the inside, right in here, we have two, and over there is the outer one. So that makes three heads. And that's why they call it uh, the triceps. Uh, for you, drawing and painting, uh, the lower half on the back of the arm it becomes quite flat. Not totally flat. It still has roundness to it, like a cylinder. But it's much flatter than, say, uh, the upper part here, uh, because we're in this common tendon area. We're drawing the common tendon just underneath the skin. Well, now we get into something to talk about, and that is your forearm. Now, there are over 20 muscles on the forearm, enough to make strong artists weep. <laughs> but I have good news tonight. We do not need to learn all 20 muscles. Because in artistic anatomy, if muscles are having the same function and living in the same group, they all go into that one shape. And so all 20 muscles on a forearm just go into three shapes. K, 
Can you do the three shapes on your drawings and paintings? Of course you can. And that is really the way to study them now. At a later date, for some curious reason that you'd want to know all about, flexor digitorum sublimis and flexor digitorum profundus or flexor carpi radialis, you could learn them individually. But I'm going to just show you the three shapes that you will see on your models. All right, and why we have those three shapes? It's very simple. You have a mass of muscle on the front of your forearm, which sends, you know, because there are individual muscles in there living in one, sh one group, one shape, so you start to see these tendons coming down, right, going into your wrist. And when you pull, when you pull on this, this mass on the front of your forearm, it pulls your wrist up and it pulls your palm of your hand up. So that's why they call this shape on the front of your forearm the flexor group, the flexor shape, because this is flexion. It flexes the wrist and the hand. When you pull your hand the other way, when you pull it towards the back, you're extending your wrist and your hand. And so we have a mass to draw on the back of the forearm, and you simply call that right now the extensor group or the extensor shape. Now normally that would be it. You would just put a kind of a stretched out football shape on the front of the uh, forearm and another one over here on the back of the forearm. And the tendons would go down into the, the wrist and the fingers and the ones on the front would pull the hand towards the front and the muscles on the back would pull the hand towards the back. Obviously, it's more important for us to bend the hand and the fingers towards the front, right? So humans and primates have way more flexor muscles than muscles on the back. Because there, you see, we can't, even, we can't even bend our fingers around. We just don't have much need to bend our fingers around towards the back. But this was important for our species to grab. Seems like people are still grabbing. <laughs> so, so way more important for the front. So I'm going to um, go ahead and put the, uh, the flexor shape right here on the front of the forearm. Now here's what I have to tell you, and you're not expected to remember everything tonight, but I have to do a little talk, so I have to keep talking. But this shape that you draw on the front of your forearm is always coming off of the inner condyle. You just write that in your notes. That bump right there is where the, the whole shape on the front of the forearm is coming from. So when you're, when you're putting your brush on the canvas or you're putting your pencil to the paper, you're putting the pencil right here at the inner condyle of the humerus. That's where all this flexor shape starts from. So there I am at the inner condyle. I make this little, maybe sort of a stretched out oval coming down like this. It's also true that about halfway down these forearms and also on your leg, your lower leg, the bellies stop and things get more quiet in your modeling, whether you're painting, modulating, drawing, or sculpting, because now you're going more into all the tendons of these muscles in the flexor group. So even in the contour, right, we have a nice curve there, and then things become uh, more straightened out in the contour in the lower half. That occurs that bulging is here in the upper half and things are more block-like and straighter in the lower half of the forearm. We put a big F, we put a big F on that shape so we can always remember it uh, as the flexor muscles. Everything in there is a flexor something. Flexors of the wrist, 
coming down the radius, flexors of the wrist coming down the ulnar. A lecture like this is really not designed to chop up every little muscle in that group. Right now, if you can just think of it as the flexor shape on the front of the forearm, always coming from right here, from the inner condyle, and you're doing a lot, you're doing good. On the back, I have a football shape, a stretched out oval shape, coming off of the, uh, this time, it's the outer condyle. Can you maybe make a note of that? That when you're drawing the shape on the front of the forearm, you're always coming from right here, from the inner condyle. And when you're drawing the shape on the back of the forearm, you're coming off of this one, off of the outer condyle, and a little bit on top of the condyle as well. It's important to note that it's, your shape is also up here a ways, a little bit above the condyle as well. All these muscles in here, again, halfway down, start turning into their tendons, and in fact, one of the muscles in there, we can see the tendon when we pull our fingers back. We can see the branches going into all the digits, into the last bones of your fingers. But really, we don't see them going into the last bones. These tendons on the back of the hand take a dive on the first segment of each finger and go deep after that. So you'll see them crossing your knuckles and then disappearing about halfway down the first segment of each finger. This is one of your extensor muscles. This whole shape on the back of a forearm that you draw is all extensor somethings. These are all your extensor muscles because extension means to pull the wrist and the hand towards the back. That's extension. And the group on the front was to pull the hand and the wrist towards the front and we call that flexion. So, pretty simple in a way, because I haven't even talked about any crossing over, but crossing shouldn't bother you either. If you just go from, from outside to inside with all these things that we're doing, just like we took this radius from outside over to inside. The thing to remember now, flexor shape on the front, big sort of stretched out oval of extensors on the back. However, that only takes care of uh, pulling your hand towards the front or pulling your hand towards the back. We need one more form to turn the hand and the wrist this way. Flexors only go up and down like that. Extensors only go to the back, right? So we need one more form and we're done with the forearm. We need one more form that's going to do this for your hand. So let me show you. It starts up here, one third of the way up the humerus. And here it is, you know, there's a swelling up here. You can't leave it off. Is this thing very important. There's no artist that doesn't know this muscle right here. Actually, this is a good time to show you something. If you put your thumb in the pit of your elbow and you put your index finger on the point of your elbow in the back, you have, with your fingers now, your thumb and your index, you have between your fingers the flexor group. And outside of your fingers, is the extensor shape on the back and this middle muscle, which I'm about to show you. Okay, so in the pit of the elbow with one finger and the index on the point of the elbow, that's where my flexors are. So they're not totally 
up on top here. They're a little bit over here on the inside if you get my drift. And then outside of my fingers on the back is the extensor shape and this middle form, which every artist knows about. And here's this middle form now coming from one third of the way above the outer condyle. And then the, the belly you see is a long slender stretched out oval. And then the tendon just goes right down the radius bone and attaches right here to the, uh, to the outside of the shaft of the radius before we get to the wrist. There's the tendon of this famous muscle that started one third of the way up on the outside of uh, condyle of your humerus. We'll take the bone out of there now so you can see that important shape. And that is called the brachioradialis muscle or simply nicknamed the supinator. The supinator because when that thing pulls and pulls what it's going to do is uncross the bones which are in this position are crossed, right? So when it pulls, it uncrosses the bones and puts your hand into the palm up position, which is supination. So it is the supinator. Or your book, your anatomy book might say uh, brachioradialis because it's on the arm and it's coming down the radius uh, bone. I'm going to show you something now which I hope will explain this challenging area for artists. I couldn't do forearms for quite a while in the beginning, but after a while it does yield and you really do know what you're doing. So here it is. You see one third of the way up on the outside always on the outer condyle for this famous supinator muscle, one third of the way up, and then all the way down the radius and attach it over here to the outside of the radius like that. And when the bones have, have been crossed like that, you see you pull and pull on this string or this blue tape and it will uncross the two bones and put the palm up. So that's why it's a supinator. Well then you might ask, yeah, but how, how do you, if the supinator uncrosses the bones, how do, how do we put the palm down? Well in with your uh, flexors, right in there with your flexors, which always come off of the inner condyle, you have a little muscle which goes halfway down. This tape is a little bit short, but it would go halfway down the radius, on the inside of the radius, just like that. And it's in with your flexor shape, and that little muscle is called the pronator. So you can see by its position, right, the little piece of tape, the pronator pulls and pulls and pulls, and would pull it so that the bones cross over, and the palm is down in pronation. And now the, the big long one, the big supinator, has all been kind of crossed over, so now when it pulls, it wants to uncross itself and uncross the bones. So you have the little pronator working with the supinator. The pronator pronates, and the supinator uncrosses and puts your hand into a position like a bowl of soup. So what happens uh, in that drawing? Let's, let's see what happens in this uh, drawing over here. Uh, all these, um, so up here, let's start over here. Up here we have a little piece of the supinator. That was this one over here. In this back view, you only get a little bit up on top of the extensors, you only get a little bit, a little viewing of the supinator from the back view. We get a big viewing of the supinator in this front view with the palm forward. Because here we are again, going one third of the way up, the outer condyle, and there it is. There's brachioradialis 
or the long supinator, and there it changes about halfway down the forearm, changes from its belly into its tendon, goes right into the bottom of the radius bone on the outside, and put a big S on that for the supinator. You could do the uh, colors. You could do the uh, anatomical coloring book. Color, you know, the flexors red, color the extensors blue, color the supinator yellow. Or if you were looking at a more detailed anatomy book, like Gray's Anatomy, everything that says flexor something or other, you paint it red. Everything that says extensor something or other, you paint it blue. And then, of course, the brachial radialis or the supinator, you use a different color for that, and you would see your three groups. But I don't have to color it. You can see flexors here, supinator is always over there. Look at how your biceps always, artists love to show on a well-developed arm, they love to show the biceps coming down and inserting themselves into the pit of the elbow between the flexor shape and the supinator shape over there on the outside. Up here, covering all of this business, would be your deltoid, right? Deltoids. All of this, you see, all of that origins of the biceps gets covered over. We could erase all of that if we wanted to uh, because the shape of the deltoid fits right over all the origins of the biceps. And the same would be true over here. Your deltoid would come down like this and insert right here between biceps on the front and a little bit of triceps from the back. Keep in mind that your deltoid also grows off of all of this, all of this bony ridge, all of this bony ridge here of the shoulder blade from below is for the famous deltoid muscle. So deltoid would come around like that, you see. I'm not going to erase the uh, bone underneath so you can keep in mind where your triceps originated from underneath that deltoid, but I have given you the outline here of the deltoid muscle. Deltoids are uh, going all the way around. You have fibers over here coming off of the outer half of your collarbone from below. Remember the deltoid goes halfway down to the outside of the humerus, and I swear this person must have done something with his upper limbs because this is huge right here. He's got a big deposit of calcium right here for his deltoid. There's a mountain right there. So that's very low, isn't it? Don't draw your deltoids up too high. Don't make them, ha don't make them halfway down either because we can't see it going to the bone. So just a little bit above halfway is where your, your line of your deltoid should, should come to. So we've got deltoid right here on the front coming off of the collarbone. We've got deltoid over here on the side. And we have deltoid over here coming off of the bony ridge of the scapula from the back. So there are actually, even though it looks like one shape, there are actually those three sections to your uh, deltoid. And Michelangelo actually uses three shapes. Of course, he likes to emphasize muscular, you know. So he's turned um, what most of us would just be one shape into a shape on the front, a shape on the side, and a shape in the back. So it's not three different muscles. It's the different areas of the deltoid. So let's uh, complete this over here a little bit. Uh, looks very empty, doesn't it, in this back view of this right arm. And it is empty because in order to look more realistic, we have to draw a nice contour on the inside of this back view of the forearm, which is coming off of the inner condyle, a little swelling like that, and then into a little tendon that goes down. And that's more like it. And what you're seeing right there 
is a small portion of the flexor group from the front in that back view. And uh, it's uh, just on the other side of this bony uh, groove where the ulnar bone or the ulnar shaft is. So when you're drawing a back view of the uh, forearm, you have your flexors over here on one side of the ulnar, coming off of the outer condyle of the humerus, and then you have the, the it's gonna look like a groove. The, the shaft of the ulnar is gonna look like a groove because these muscles are swelling, right? They're bulging. And then over here on the other side of the uh, groove of the ulnar uh, is gonna be a little portion of your flexors from the front. It's nice to go home, uh, and when you're studying anatomy, you know, you really have to, like, use the mirrors and use touching. It's, it's nothing like touching the bone and feeling your entire ulnar can be touched from the point of the elbow all the way down to that landmark knob or head at the lower end of the ulnar. All of this is right on the surface. So you've got... Um, mostly extensor shape on the back and a little bit of the flexors on the other side of the ulnar bone, which is really from the front. Uh, what else can we go into here a little bit? Let's take care of this view a little bit more now. Uh, what we'd have up here, of course, surrounding the ball and socket is a shape to the deltoid. Lots of variation to the shapes of deltoids. Could be very uh, block-like, could be more like an oval, depends on the model you want or the model that you have at hand. And uh, after the deltoid, of course, we're running into biceps right in here. Here's your biceps. Inserting into the pit of the elbow like that. Over here is a little bit of the flexors and over here uh, from the outside, right, from the outer condyle, we run into uh, these extensor muscles in the extensor group. And look at how they just follow the spiraling or the crossing over, the way the radius crossed over the ulnar, the way this supinator is crossing from outside to inside. All of this, all of these forms are extensor muscles all going from outside to inside now because the bones are crossed. So all the muscles had to follow suit, had to cross over uh, with it. So very complex area, uh, worth a little bit of study on the forearm. Uh, no other area, I think, are you gonna be uh, asked to worry about all this rotation all this pronation and supination. Don't, you know, don't give up on forearms. They can definitely be uh, understood, but not right away. For most of us, not, not right away. It's, 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 a, it's a handful, uh, but very exciting and really gave us a, a lift in evolution. I mean, think about it. Think about these movements. I remember going up to Bar Harbor once and looking at the seals and noticing that all they had coming out of their rib cage was a little flapper like that. And it really dawned on me, oh my God, what we have, well, I'm sure he thinks his flapper is fantastic, right? <laughs> but I was thinking, wow, you know, instead of a little flapper, we've, we've got all of this, which gives us a great lift, I think, in uh, what we do. I mean, we can come to the league and we can draw, uh, we can, we can pull uh, corks out of wine bottles. Uh, we, could, we could play piano. You know, pia piano has a lot of this motion, this uh, pronation and supination uh, with, with the wrist. Uh, we could also put keys into keyholes and get into locked doors. We can turn screwdrivers. Does anybody turn a screwdriver anymore? Well, this muscle gets very big. This one right here, this supinator because that's what it does. So when you turn a manual screwdriver all day, <laughs> you, you develop 
these muscles. But now it's all electric, so people don't do that as much. I, I might, uh, since we have some time left, I might uh, introduce you a little bit uh, to, uh, to the hand, give you an idea about what, uh, what's going to be coming up uh, with the hand business. And, um, you know, the thing to think about with hands really is that uh, we have grasping, we can do so much with it. It's another uh, area that I think uh, students sometimes worry about, uh, how to draw the hands, how to draw the thumb. Uh, it's understandable that it would give you challenge in the beginning because it has a lot of bones. There's a lot of bones to it. And um, they don't have to all be going the same way, you know? In fact, the more interesting drawings and paintings and sculpture is when you have more action, more, more variety, uh, more, more expression to the hand. So you don't want to always have it like this, you know, or you don't want to be like, I like Napoleon best, he keeps his hand in the vest. <laughs> no, you want to show those hands. Even, even when you're doing a portrait, it's nice. You see Rembrandt always has a hand down there. It's, it's a part of the portrait. And it's also probably a, a, a good uh, part of the design to make your eye, you know, come off of the head and come around and see the hand down there. I just love going to the Frick to see the portrait of the man in the red hat. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, painting. But there's so many great paintings uh, in the Frick. We also have now Max uh, uh, Beckman at uh, Metropolitan Museum. German Expressionist. So I um, can't wait to see that show. But uh, with the hand, you, you know, what you're faced with and what you have to practice is draw your own hand. Supposedly the story goes that Michelangelo was drawing his hand every day. So you could put your hand or your foot on a pillow and draw it, if not every day, once in a while. You can get a statue of a hand if you want, draw some. But also copy the masters. You know, if you're having any questions about these forearms or about the hands, uh, I always go to get my answers from the old drawings. Uh, those are the best teachers. So uh, if you've got some drawings in your book or on Google from Raphael drawing the hands, uh, those would be the ones to, to learn from and draw from. The skeleton always looks like it has long fingers. That's until you realize that the first set of long bones is in the body of the hand. See, this first set in here is the metacarpals beyond the wrist, and those are all in here. It's just the last three bones that are for the fingers. And uh, when you draw the hands like anything else, you, you want to think about what kind of a figure you want to create, if you're creating your own action figures, or if you have a certain model, a uh, certain portrait. Uh, the hand has to relate to the head, right? So if you're doing somebody, you know, who drives a truck for a living and has got a big square jaw, he might have a, 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 a trucker's hand. You've got to think about the style and the type. Whereas if you're doing some elegant, high society lady, you don't want to put the truck driver's hand uh, on that one. So, uh, yeah, hands. And, and also, I want to say that uh, the masters, when you look at those old drawings, they, they, have a way, they have their own way with figures, right? So they have their own way uh, that they draw a figure, and they have their own way that they draw a hand. A hand by Van Dyke is different than a hand by uh, Rubens. And so the way you draw the hands might be different as well. And that's artistic creativity, I think. I'm glad, I'm glad that we have Rembrandt's way of drawing hands. Well, thank you all for coming this evening. It's been a pleasure, and good night. That's just amazing, and I'm, I am grateful to all, all the folks that are tuning in, and many of them, I have known them for many years, and just want to say thank you, and have a good night.
wonderful. Just wonderful.